welcome everyone to this um, very important webinar in relation to understanding the assessment processes and care planning when working with older people, their families, advocates and carers. We've got some great community leaders here, Angela and Paulina, who've done amazing work in the field, working daily with um, vulnerable communities and families in the assessment process um, in order to get um, people's needs met. Um, and also to understand it from a cultural safety perspective and a cultural lens. So we're really excited to collaborate with Angela and Paulina and, of course, all graduates. So before we hear from Angela and Paulina, I'd first like to give you a bit of an overview of the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. So our vision is that all aged care consumers in Australia experience inclusive and accessible care, that they feel safe, that they feel respected, and that their culture and lifestyle and identity is recognised. Um, we want to do that by building the capacity and capability of aged care providers to deliver services that are welcoming, inclusive and accessible. And we do that through um, things like this, workshops and training to people that work directly with older people across Australia, um, training and um, advice to aged care providers and diversity consulting. And we also have resources on our website, multilingual resources. Um, which we went through in our previous uh, webinar with Sunisha, but um, welcome you to um, to visit our website because that's where we have a hub of information about aged care in many, many different languages. So the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing is part of the PCAC Alliance, the Partners in Culturally Appropriate Care, and we are funded by the Department of Health. Um, and the PCAC Alliance has a member in each state and territory. So the centre is the Victorian member, but if you go onto the PCAC Alliance website, you'll be able to see the member in that state and territory that you reside in. And, and feel free to reach out to that member and get advice about culturally appropriate care in aged care as well. So um, that's just a little bit of an overview of how the centre situates itself within the aged care sector and funding um, programs. And now I'll pass it over to Angela. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, there's 18 ACAS departments um, in Victoria. So both Paulina and I um, are from two separate um, ACAS departments. Um, I'm located at Bundura ACAS, which is in the northern suburbs of Metro Melbourne. And Paulina is at Northwest ACAS, um, which covers some of the north and the west um, catchment. So we, our team is made up of um, it's a multidisciplinary team. So we've got about 28 staff. Um, which includes registered nurses, social workers, um, we've got a couple of OT, speech therapists, dietitian, geriatrician, and also administration staff. Um, we assess about 3,400 people per year, approximately. Um, and we're also located at Northern Health Service. So we're affiliated with um, a large public hospital health service um, in the north. We have a high proportion of cold clients. Um, approximately, we use between 60 to 70 percent of our clients do require interpreters. Um, and for us, our particular organisation, we actually have um, an in-house interpreter service that has approximately 40 staff. Um, and we also use telephone interpreter services and also on call um, if we're not able to access interpreters um, through our organisation. Um, the sort of languages that are included in our catchment includes Arabic, Assyrian, Turkish, Italian, Greek, Macedonian, Bosnian, Serbian, Croatian, Persian, Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Punjabi, Hindi, Nepali and Urdu. Um, ACAS pays for the use of interpreters um, and usually our bookings for an assessment are around 90 minutes um, for community assessments. Sometimes you may request longer if it's a couple um, and then in the hospital setting as well, we usually take about 30 to 60 minutes to conduct our assessments with an interpreter. Thank you, Angela. Um, as Angela mentioned, I work at a different team and we've recently changed our name to Aged Care Assessment Services. Um, and this is because we uh, traditionally only manage the Northwest Aged Care Assessment Team, which cover the local government area of Moreland, Mooney Valley, Hume and City of Melbourne here in Victoria. 
Um, but recently, in the last six months, we've also taken over doing assessments, at regional assessment services in the Hume region um, of Melbourne Health. We're in the middle of sort of the northwest corridor um, of Melbourne, and we have Bundura ACAS, who are to the right of us, and Western ACAS to the left. Now, our team, uh, we also have um, registered nurses, social workers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, geriatrician and administration. At the moment, we have around 21 staff, but our EFT is around 29. We assess approximately around 5,031 people per year. Um, that's for the ACAS team and for the regional assessment services. Even though we've just taken over, we look at about a 1,000 assessments a year in the Hume region. Um, we are located at Melbourne Health Service and sit under the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Um, and we're the second highest use of interpreters um, team in Victoria. The 80% plus of our clients require interpreters. Um, and we do have quite a new emerging refugee population in the Hume region. Uh, we do lots of assessments in the hospital setting and the Royal Melbourne Hospital do have some in-house interpreters. Um, but we do actually broker out our interpreters for community assessments, which is quite different to, to Northern Health and Bundura ACAS. We do face-to-face -face assessment, telephone, and also telehealth assessment. Um, the languages that we predominantly use in the Northwest would be Italian, Greek, Arabic, Assyrian, and Mandarin. Um, however, we also have a smaller population of Eastern European languages. Thank you, Angela. So just some background to what ACAS and ACAT um, include. So the ACAS um, stands for the Aged Care Assessment Service, and this is also interchangeable with the ACAT, um, so it's the Aged Care Assessment Team. Um, in Victoria, we're called the ACAS, but the other states um, within Australia are called an ACAT. So um, depending on what state you're residing in, you'll have an interchangeable names, but that means the same program. Um, so it's a nationally funded program by the Commonwealth um, since 1985. Um, it's an independent assessment agency. In Victoria, the majority of the 18 ACAS departments are affiliated with a public health service um, in Victoria, but in other states, this may be different. So they may actually be affiliated with private organisations. Um, so My Aged Care is the overarching um, body. So it's more like a, a gateway um, where people can access um, information and also have referral to have an assessment done. So there's the My Aged Care Contact Centre. Um, I think currently there's two locations, one in Brisbane and one in Box Hill. So there's a national phone number that clients um, or carers can contact um, if they want to be registered and have an assessment. And then we've got two arms of assessment. So we've got the Regional Assessment Service, which is the RAS, and the ACAS, which is the Aged Care Assessment Service. Um, and like Pauline had already mentioned, um, her organisation has both arms. Um, and there's been some changes over the past sort of 12 months in regards to um, the ACAS and the RAS merging, and that's what they're looking at towards the future, having only one assessment um, service that will combine both the RAS and the ACAS. So My Aged Care is the gateway, um, and our services that we approve for in regards to the ACAS are under the Aged Care Act of 1997. Um, and there's, it helps with the interface between hospital, community, residential care, home care packages, and also access to Commonwealth home support programs. So they're the sort of um, assessments and referrals that we would get through um, <clears throat> My Aged Care. So the function of the ACAS is to complete a comprehensive assessment. Um, and what we focus is on wellness and also reablement. Um, part of our <clears throat> process um, once an assessment is done, we do a case conference and our teams are made up of multidisciplinary um, health professionals as well. So the approvals that an ACAS um, would do in regards to programs include, include permanent residential care, but that's for those people that want to enter 
a um, residential care facility, they will need an approval under the Aged Care Act. Residential respite care, so there's two different types that we would differentiate it um, with. So we have high or low approvals. Um, and this entitles a person up to 63 days per year to access um, respite care in a residential care facility. The other programs that we do approvals for include the transition care program. Um, and this is for people that are um, still have goals um, they're in hospital and they have goals to enable them to achieve maybe better function um, or organise more time for them to make a decision on whether they need can return home or not. Um, and it really includes the, um, allied health, import, nursing and also geriatricians as well um, to support people post-discharge from hospital. So transition care program is an approval. Um, that we would only do for a hospital assessment um, and the, the client has to be in hospital to have this approval completed. The next one is home care packages, um, which are packages um, that are available to clients in their home. Um, and these home care packages are made up of four different levels depending on the client's needs. So we have levels one, two, three, and four. And this will be determined by the assessor and the multidisciplinary team um, in regards to where the person's um, care needs fit. Um, and we guide it by using a home care package matrix to assist with our decision making. And we also determine whether they're eligible for um, a home care package. And the sort of things that people can access through home care packages um, include like personal care, meal assistance, um, domestic help, transport, um, social support, flexible respite um, in the home. And then the last program that we do approvals for is a short-term restorative care program. Um, and this particular program is only for eight weeks. So it's actually to help people um, improve their function um, while they're at home. And this might include having some allied health input, social work might be involved in, a, in their GP, um, and to give short intensive therapies to people in their home um, and to prevent them from being admitted to hospital or um, into residential care unnecessarily. So in regards to having an aged care assessment um, <clears throat> approvals under the Act, we, do, we talk about eligibility so the, the clients that we would assess are older people that have to be over the age of 65. Um, occasionally we do um, assess people under 65 and these are those that may have chronic conditions um, or under the National Disability Service um, as well. So they may be transitioning across to aged care because their care needs can't be met under disability. Um, we also assess the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, that are over 50 years of age. Vulnerable groups, so clients that may come from cold backgrounds, refugees, um, homeless, care leavers, stolen generation and people from the LGBTI communities. Complex and people at risk um, and access to Commonwealth Health Home Support Services as well. So we can do approvals for um, those particular services in the community. I think Angela's given quite a nice overview of what ACAS does, and I just wanted to briefly um, give you some information about what the regional assessment team do and what the difference is between the two. Um, so the regional assessment service, they also conduct aged care assessments, but they really look at those entry-level home support services. Um, across Australia, they can be linked with private organisations, uh, linked with councils, and also with health services like they are in our team. Um, and the regional assessment service uh, would refer to Commonwealth Home Support Program, which is the CHISP services, which really looks at those entry level services like planned activity groups, domestic assistance, personal care, flexible respite, meals, home modifications, access to allied health, 
Um, the real big difference between the entry level services and the home care package is that we would like to see people commence on entry level services to meet a specific need. And then if they're needing some more coordination or flexibility in the care that they need to receive, that's when they could move on to um, have an assessment and have a home care package. We could still provide those services, but in a more coordinated approach. Um, important to note that uh, ACAS assessors are tertiary trained. Um, in Victoria, the RAS assessors are also tertiary trained, but this may also differ um, from state to state. So I know that in some other states, RAS assessment officers would only have, um, I guess, uh, certificate qualifications. So the, the focus of the assessment is quite different. Um, the ACAS assessment is quite comprehensive. So you may find that the clinician is, has a stronger focus on cognition, health concerns, coming from more of a clinical um, perspective rather than just looking at a home support need. Thanks, Angela. Um, just a little bit about the RAS function. Um, the RAS assessors would undertake a home support assessment, um, underpinning as well on the wellness and reablement approach. So we're really trying to improve people wellbeing um, living at home and ensure that clients can live independently in the community of their choice. Uh, we would use the same assessment tool um, and develop a support plan which really identifies the person's strengths and goals and match them to appropriate services within my aged care, but also explore services in the community outside of my aged care. Thanks, Ed. Just a thanks, Angela. Next slide. Yep, a little bit of a flow chart. Um, Angela's already touched on this about the My Age Care Assessment and Service Referral Pathway, but I thought I would just include a bit of a visual here. So, um, on the left hand side, you can see the blue box that's the My Age Care Contact Center. So, that's sort of the first layer of the pathway, and that is where registration and screening of clients occurs. So clients can refer themselves to my aged care or their representatives can call in or a health professional or a service provider and they can make a referral for someone needing some supports. And this can be done either via phone call or a web referral. And then the my aged care contact centre would do the registration of the client and do some general screening about um, to determine which assessment pathway would be the most appropriate for the client. So if they're just needing some entry level services and they're just entering the aged care pathway, they would generally be referred to the regional assessment service, which would look at the home support needs and refer to home support programs. So the basic level, low intensity home support services and really focusing on that wellness reablement focus. If there is a lot of complexity, lots of hospital admissions, vulnerabilities, there are this My Aged Care Contact Centre may refer directly to ACAS for a comprehensive assessment. And the ACAT team would still look at those home support program needs, but also look at the Commonwealth subsidised programs that Angela mentioned that are under the Act, such as residential aged care, home care packages and transitional care. Um, we would generally say that in the pathway, if someone comes through to the ACAT team initially, we would want to make sure that they have a RAS assessment first um, to make sure that there are their needs are being met immediately with those entry level services before we look at any um, further approvals. But that does change from client to client. Thanks, Angie. Thank yeah. Um, so this just, just gives a, you. Sorry. So just before we go into the next one, I just got a quick question that's come through from one of our interpreters. Um, does this information apply to Western Australia, is this a national uh, approach? Yes, my, my understanding it is a national approach. Um, both states have RAS and also ACAS. So the the My Age Care Contact Centre will screen and then determine um, which will be the most appropriate pathway depending on the, the referral and the client's needs. Okay, thank you very much for that, Paulina.
So all clients need to be registered with My Aged Care um, prior to being able to access a RAS or an ACAS assessment. Um, and they're all given an individual um, identification number, which we call an AC number. Um, so if they need to access their um, assessment post um, having an assessment, they can use that particular ID number um, to have a look at their information on My Aged Care. Um, there's been lots of changes to the My Aged Care website um, and the portal. Um, so there's the professionals got a, 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 a one particular um, access. Um, clients can access via their portal. Um, and then there's also provider portal as well that looks a little bit different. So this particular screenshot I've got up here is for um, clients to access. And there's lots of information on there about what costs, how to find a service provider, um, information about aged care, um, help at home, and then what you're eligible for as well. And then there's the referral pathways, which Paul, Pauline has already mentioned. Um, let's see. So this just gives you an example of what we see. Um, it's called our dashboard, which is the assessor portal. Um, providers have a different version, and I'm sure the contact centre have something else as well, um, but they're all linked in together. So we can find clients if we do a client search. We've got the orange um, card there that, which shows our referrals. So they come through and then we triage them depending on the information that's provided. Um, we also have reviews where we go in and, and update people's um, referrals if they want additional services. Assessments, right on the, on the right side, the yellow one, um, that's where our assessors will be um, provided a list of the clients that have been allocated to them. So then they'll get clients into their, into their portal. Um, and one, one thing that is a little bit different to the ACAS is that we have delegate decisions. So for any approvals under the Aged Care Act, um, we have a delegate that needs to ensure that the information that's provided um, in the assessment um, determines that it is correct and also the person is eligible for that particular um, approval. So um, that we have a delegate and they are actually the representative from Canberra to ensure um, that what we're doing and diligence in regards to um, assessments and that they meet the criteria for an approval. Um, and the delegates undergo specific training um, and have to have experience as, as an ACAS assessor. And there's a couple of few other functions on there, but that just gives you an overview of what we use. And that's national. So this is the same nationally. So this is just some locations in regards to um, where you may be asked to attend an assessment. Um, we probably do, at our particular um, assessment agency, we do about 70% um, in clients' homes within the community. Um, and then hospitals, we do about 30%. But each ACAS is different depending on um, where they're located, um, whether they're regional um, or metro. Um, other locations you may need to attend might be at retirement villages or SRS, um, which are supported resi residential services. So they're more like lodges. Um, you may need to attend in a residential care facility as well. And then there's the hospitals or inpatient units too. So that might include acute, subacute, both public and private as well. So we do assessments in both public and private hospital settings. Uh, Paulina. Um, and just a little bit about the actual assessment tool that we use. So um, when we're asking for an interpreter to come out on an assessment, this is really what the tool that we use to gather our information and to assess the client. Um, it is embedded within the portal that Anne showed you before. Um, and it, the assessment takes around 90 minutes. Um, and most of I mean, our assessors will try to, uh, I guess, ask a lot of the questions in these different domains more in a conversation style um, rather than make 
the client feel like we're doing an assessment. Um, but just some of the domains that we cover um, is the social domain, which really looks at the family supports and any other support networks that the client may have um, and the activities that they may be involved um, socially and in the community. We also look at the carer um, and if there are any carer concerns. So um, are there any formal supports for the carer? Who identifies an, as an informal carer? Um, the details of the care support that they are providing um, and how sustainable that caring arrangement is. And we also look at whether the actual client is a carer for another person in the household um, as well, focusing on what kind of care they're providing um, and is this a sustainable arrangement. Um, we focus a lot on the medical aspect, which is about the GP connections. You know, do they have a regular GP? Are they? How often are they seeing this GP? Are they receiving any other supports from specialist services or any other clinics? Um, any recent hospitalisations um, and what that means for the person, whether they've had any um, health or functional decline and also their health conditions and really um, focus on how those health conditions are impacting um, their well-being and what kind of supports they're needing to manage those health conditions. We look at as well the physical component, um, which has quite a few areas in it. Um, one being the functional section. So we really look at you know, how the person is managing at home, general activities of daily living. Are they able to mobilise? Are they able to transfer? Are they able to manage their personal care, toileting? Are they continent? You know, how they're managing their medications? Can they manage their domestic tasks, things like cleaning and cooking? Or can they get out in the community themselves? We also look at um, the physical component, which is their medications, any sensory needs, or do they have any concerns with their vision or hearing, um, any communication difficulties, is there a history of falls, and is there any concerns with their driving ability if they are driving? And also personal health, which looks at their oral health, um, any swallowing concerns, pain, uh, sleeping, physical activity, skin integrity and nutrition. Uh, ACAS also have a strong focus on looking at the psychological section, um, which looks at cognition, psychosocial and psychological. And that really looks at, um, uh, you know, are there any cognitive changes? Have there been any diagnosis of uh, dementia or any cognitive concerns that's impacting their safety at home? Um, you know, has there, are there any, um, they had any supports or any assessments of their cognition, a family concerned about the changes um, and how the person is managing? Um, have there been any changes in personality or behaviours? Is there any anxiety, social isolation? And really focusing on those psychological aspect of um, you know, short-term memory loss, long-term memory loss, judgment, looking at if there's any aggressive behaviours, hallucinations, wandering, confusion. Um, so we do look at that in quite a lot of detail um, and we do use some supplementary assessment tools as a screening tool to help us identify if there are any cognitive um, concerns, but also ask the question of how those concerns may be impacting the person's safety and their ability to manage at home. Um, another aspect of the assessment tool is home and personal safety. So really assessing what the home environment is like and seeing if there's any concerns or risks, for example, um, for falls. If someone is having lots of falls at home, we want to make sure that the home environment um, is safe. And if it's not, whether we need to refer on to any community um, services, for example, for an occupational therapist to come out and review the home setup. Um, and also personal safety is their safety to the person themselves. And this is an area where we may um, discuss if there's been any concerns raised around, um, I guess, elder abuse or any concerns raised around the person's safety managing tasks at home if there is a cognitive impairment. Um, as Angela mentioned, there are some complex complexity indicators and vulnerability 
um, that we look at in the assessment, vulnerability risks, and they are things like inadequate housing, so is someone at a risk of homelessness, insecure tenure, or hoarding and squalor? Uh, is there a risk of or confirmed abuse? Um, is there any emotional or mental health issues that significantly limit self-care capacity? Um, so it's not really, you know, if someone just has a, a diagnosis of depression, that wouldn't necessarily fall under a complexity indicator. It would be more if they have a significant um, concern or issue around that area that really impacts their safety living at home. Um, financial disadvantage, any adverse effects of institutionalisation. So, for example, people who've been in prison, foster care or any other um, care institution. Um, any drug, alcohol concerns, um, and any significant cognitive issues that also limit the person's ability to manage their self-care tasks. And the vulnerability risk, um, the Commonwealth has, um, I guess, identified that older people who fall under the um, vulnerable group uh, may require additional supports and short-term management um, to access services. So we do like to check if anyone falls under this group so we know how to support them better in the community. As an Ange, Ange mentioned them earlier, but they are the, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander group, veterans, refugees, asylum seekers, um, the LGBTI community, the cold community, and also the socially isolated um, community. Now, when we do our assessment, um, we do use some additional tools. Um, to support the information that we've gathered through the assessment process, so through the conversation, but also through observational skills that we, our clinicians use to assess how the person is functioning or the home environment. And some of the tools that we use is the mini mental um, status examination that um, assesses a person's cognitive ability, the RUDAS, um, which also is used for cognition, the GDS, which is the Geriatric Depression Scale, um, which focuses on mood, the Carer Strain Index. So if we've identified that the carer is under stress, we may decide to do a Carer Strain Index. Uh, the Genogram, I think, and your team uses that more. It's not embedded within the NSAF. But, um, mm -hmm. And the Bartel and OARS, um, is really a functional screening tool. So when we're looking at how the person is managing their day-to-day -day activities. So when we gather all the information, um, so like I mentioned before, the assessment would take about 90 minutes. Um, we gather all that information and we also request some medical information um, from the GP or if they've had a recent hospital admissions, we would review um, the medications and the discharge summary. When we gather all that, we create a support plan um, which is really a summary of what we've recommended to the client. So we would discuss things like um, recommendations for the approvals under the Aged Care Act, so what the person is eligible for, um, and we can also make some recommendations based on those entry-level CHISP services that they can access to help them um, in the interim while they're waiting, for example, for a home care package, and also making sure that we're addressing any other concerns that may have come about from the assessment and looking at linking them in with community health services or specialist um, clinics in the community to meet their need. Um, am I able to ask a few questions, Paulina? Oh, sure. Thank you very much. Um, just a few here. As mm -hmm. an interpreter, if uh, I feel that a person is under any threat or violence, do I disclose this information to the service provider? Uh, following on, and if the aged person has asked the interpreter not to disclose that he is under threat or violence, what to do? That's a good question. Um, I Look, I, I mean, I would, look, I think I'm, the, well, the first question, I think if someone discloses that they're they're feeling that they're unsafe, um, it is really important to let them know that this is a safe space um, and that we do have some supports that we can access and to let the assessor or the clinician know. Um, you can always ask the client consent if they're happy for, for the person to, for the interpreter to share that information with us. 
Um, but I think as well, it's really important to address some of these elder abuse or safety issues because, you know, if it's not addressed and they're just telling the interpreter, where does that go? We may, you know, the interpreter may not know exactly where to link this person into. So it's just making sure that they're aware that this is a safe um, assessment and that we can help them through this process. Um, thanks. Just in regards to the interpreter's approach, I mean, we are uh, guided by the Ausit Code of Ethics and there is a confidentiality um, uh, principle there. Now, if we have to interpret everything that is said. So if the uh, aged person, the cold client has said something, we do have to interpret that. But even if they say don't interpret it, we do have to um, say in our introduction, everything in this room will be interpreted and kept confidential. So we do have to interpret whatever's being said. Uh, also, don't forget that uh, if you look at the confidentiality principle of the Ausit Code of Ethics, um, it, it says, uh, you know, where it's requested by law, um, we can disclose information. So that actually implies that if we think that um, there is a life under threat or someone's freedom is at stake mm -hmm. or someone's health is at stake, we can actually break that confidentiality principle, um, uh, which falls under our duty of care. Uh, so uh, that is something to take into consideration. And like, we'll talk about the debriefing coming up as well. Uh, but, you know, if, if I guess the interpreter is feeling that uh, the person's health, uh, freedom or uh, life is in danger, um, uh, disregarding the confidentiality principle, they are actually required by law uh, under duty of care to disclose that information if they um, have this information. Uh, and I hope, I hope that uh, clarifies that, uh, uh, that answers that question. Thanks, Fancy. That's excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Fancy. Um, just one more question before you move on. First of all, a comment saying, great flow charts, well done. Okay. Um, is the referral to home support services mean tested? Means tested? I don't, I don't think it is, Ange. I don't think it's... No, it's not means tested. There's a, there is a, a fee that they would have to pay, um, but it's up to the provider to... If, if someone, you know, had some financial um, issues, they may actually be able to waive the daily fee. So, for example, if they required domestic assistance and it was going to cost $10, they may actually um, only charge them $5, depending on their financial circumstances. Um, the means testing would occur for home care packages um, and residential care um, approvals. So, if they entered into an agreement with a particular provider, they, will ne they need to lodge um, a means test assessment through Centrelink and that, that will be determined by the government how much funding they will receive from the Commonwealth and how much they would be out of pocket. So that's for the home care packages in regards to home care. But mm -hmm. under the test providers, it, it, it's not means tested. So um, and then, I think that's also why in a lot of cases we actually recommend some clients stay on chip services because they um, may be out of pocket a lot more on a home care package. So they're actually more suitable to stay on TIS services if they're able to um, from a financial point of view. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Angela and Paulina. Uh, there's quite a few more questions, but I'll let you continue. If we have time at the end, um, I'll direct them to you. If not, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, we'll answer these questions in a written format and um, get them back to you in an mm -hmm. FAQ style. All right, thank you very much. I'll let you continue. Thank you, Fatih. Um, just a quick flow chart, just so you um, have a bit of an idea. We, we For the NSAF, the assessment tool, the call centre, the RAS team and the ACAS team actually use the same assessment um, to gather their information and to put in their information into my aged care. Um, but it's just got a little bit of flow chart so you can see how that assessment builds over the different, um, I guess, components of the pathway. So. Looking at the left-hand side of the purple, you have the screening. So the court contact centre would do all that reason for contact, screening details, current supports, very brief functional overview and an action plan, so who they're referring to. Then the home support assessor would also use the NSAF and some of those domains that I mentioned earlier um, to gather their information and record their information. So all that functional profile, cognition, health and lifestyle profile, family, community engagement and support profile, and then they would gather that information and develop a support plan. And when it comes to the comprehensive assessment on the right, 
we would build on that information that's there and also have a, a more comprehensive um, more comprehensive information about the medical domain, the physical domain, social, um, psychological and developer support plan from that. So it's it's been um, developed really to build from that entry point through to RAS, through to ACAS. Thanks, Paulina. Um, now, I just wanted to touch on um, the supplementary assessment tools that we commonly use. Um, and really the one that um, we would most commonly use with interpreters um, and in most assessments would be the geriatric depression scale, which is the scale that looks at um, identifying any symptoms of depression in older adults. Um, there are many instruments out there that measure depression. Um, however, the GDS has been tested and used extensively um, in the older population. Um, it's actually been a tool that's been around for quite a long time. It was first created in 1986 um, and it can be used with healthy, medically ill um, or people with mild to moderate, moderate cognitive impairment, older adults. Um, and it has been extensively used in the community acute and long-term care setting. Um, so lots of tests done to it and it has been validated to about 92% sensitivity to identify if there's any um, mood concerns. It is not to be used as a substitute um, for a diagnostic interview. So it's not a diagnostic tool. It really just allows us to identify and do a screen on someone's mood and see if there are any concerns or risk of depression that needs to be followed up by a health um, professional who can do a quite a thorough um, mental health assessment. So it is an assessment, quite easy to administer. It's 15 questions um, and it looks at how the person's been feeling um, in the last week and the answers are yes or no responses only. Um, the only thing about this tool is that it hasn't been validated for use in the cold clients, but unfortunately there hasn't been anything um, developed thus far that has been validated to use in the cold community. Thanks, Ange. So um, you do have some of these tools um, attached to your resources, but as you can see, this is what it looks like. Um, so we're asking how the person has felt um, in the past week. Yes or no responses, you know, are you basically satisfied with your life? Have you dropped many of your activities or interests? Do you feel that your life is empty? Do you often get bored? Are you in good spirits most of the time? Are you afraid that something bad is going to happen to you? Do you feel helpless? Do you prefer to stay at home rather than go out and do new things? Do you feel that you have more problems with memory than most? Do you think it is wonderful to be alive now? Do you feel pretty worthless the way that you are now? Do you feel full of energy? Do you feel that your situation is hopeless? Do you think that most people are better off than you are? So that's what the tool looks like. Um, I guess some feedback that we've had from interpreters in the past is that question eight and question 14, the question about helpless, and hopeless um, can be quite challenging to interpret in different languages. Um, and this is like why I mentioned before that it hasn't been validated for the cold community. Um, and also sometimes people find it really difficult to just answer yes or no. So they might start talking about, oh, well, you know, I felt like this this day and try to explain that sometimes it's really important um, to just follow the assessor's um, lead and just say, you know, it's just a yes or no answer. Um, now that we have uh, these uh, assessments on our screen as well, I think uh, if you haven't already done so, dear interpreters, um, and like we said, we, you have access to these uh, in our um, handouts as well, it might be a good idea to actually maybe translate them beforehand so you're not put, into, put on the spot. It might be a good idea um, to see if on the internet, some of these um, assessment uh, tools I have found uh, on the internet have already been translated into other languages. Um, so you might have a look and see if it's already been translated in your LOAT. Um, 
uh, and and you know chat with other colleagues uh, about how they would translate certain things you know for example uh, that question number uh, 14 and was it question number eight um, yeah. you know yeah. just you can you can chat with your fellow colleagues about how they would translate things or interpret things um, so that's why we're here today we've got the language uh, specialists here within regards to assessment tools and the assessment tools themselves um, so please make sure that you do download those and maybe um, start doing a little bit of translation uh, and you might even take it into the next aged care assessment uh, that you go to so that it's nice and ready there for you um, uh, and it would be a good uh, good good reference for you uh, during the assessment. Mm -hmm. Thanks Fatih. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on the standardised mini mental state examination. It's not one that we commonly use with the cold population but sometimes it is used. So I just wanted to touch on it really briefly um, and you do have a copy of that as well to go through. Um, it is a tool that is really commonly used as a, to screen cognitive function. Um, and like I mentioned before, not commonly used with the cold community. And it's not really a tool that is diagnostic. It really just helps us to identify if there are any concerns um, in the cognitive domain. So, um, it can indicate a presence of cognitive impairment, such as a dementia or following a head injury, but it doesn't mean that someone does have a dementia. Um, so if we do, do, do um, administer this tool, it just allows us to look at whether they need any follow-up and any further investigations. Um, it's pretty quick and relatively easy to perform, um, but the disadvantages of this tool is that it is biased against people with poor education, um, due to elements of language and mathematical testing. It's not great for people with visual impairments. Um, and as mentioned before, it hasn't been validated with the gold community either. Thanks, Ange. So I've just attached what it looks like. Um, the different domains, cognitive domains that it looks at is orientation, registration. So really that immediate and delayed recall. So short-term memory, attention and calculation, and language, um, you know, following three stage commands and also visual spatial um, concerns. So being able to copy an image um, on the page. Thanks, Ange. Um, the Roland University Dementia Assessment Scale, the RUDAS as we referred to it, um, is really the assessment that would be good if you got familiar with as, as it is a cognitive screening instrument designed um, to minimise the effects of cultural learning and language diversity um, on the assessment of baseline or cognitive performance. It is a validated assessment tool for cold groups um, and it assesses cognitive impairment of people from all educational, cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Um, it's had lots and lots of different studies done on it and it's been reviewed by cultural advisory groups um, for ease of translation and it's also been validated in multi multicultural groups in Australia. Um, so it is a really common tool that we use when seeing people from a cold background. So this is what the tool looks like. Um, you do have a copy, I'm a bit mindful of the time so I won't go too much into it but um, it does look at memory, body orientation. So can a person show you their right foot, their left hand? Are they understanding that information and being able to carry out that, that task? Praxis, so looks at um, copying um, what the assessor is doing with their hands. The drawings, so are they able to copy an image on the page? Looks at a judgment, so it provides a scenario to a person and asks them to respond in what they would do in that situation. Um, memory, um, so ask them to repeat some of the um, tasks or items that they were asked to remember at the start of the assessment and also language, so a lot of animal naming in 60 seconds. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paulina. <laughs> um, we've got a few questions coming in in regards uh, to these tools. Um, uh, now, uh, they are available on that tip sheet that we have uploaded to our webinar. It says tip sheet cognitive assessment and you'll get the full list of all the um, assessment tools that uh, Paulina has been talking about. You've got the Rudis there, the Minimental there, as well as um, uh, the GDS there. Uh, so they are there. Some of them uh, have been been translated into other languages you'll find links there 
Uh, some of them uh, may not officially be, but you can search the internet for uh, pre-existing translations. But uh, the idea is that you now have the tools in English, so you can start translating them yourself um, in regard for, for preparation, because it's very important for us interpreters to be well prepared before any assignment. So if you look at your job offer and it says an HK assessment, then you will know that you're more than likely be um, working with one of these tools, right, Paulina? That's right, yes. Yeah. yeah. So if you see that on the job offer, it's an aged care assessment, you take out these tools that you've either downloaded or found on the internet or you've translated or you found a translated version already, um, and then you, you prepare yourself and you might even take those with you uh, for reference uh, during your job. All right, but now we know exactly what question is trying to achieve and um, we literally physically we'll have the tools as well and I think that would help immensely in our preparation for these assessment assignments. Yep and Patia I think it's important as well to mention that the interpreter is not um, you're not going to be administering the assessment tool we've been trained to um, administer, administer these screening assess these tools so it's really more about I guess having the language and being aware of how to interpret some of that information so Definitely. it's really important to interpret back exactly what the person is saying even if the interpreter may not think it's relevant because it actually could be quite relevant to the screening um, so really just following exactly what we say word for word in these um, assessment tools. Uh, that's right. So uh, the, at the end of the day, the assessor is uh, running the actual assessment. So yes, we will interpret everything that is said the way it is said uh, in that line with our accuracy principle of the OZIT Code of Ethics. But you know, it's um, a very, very good tool to have in order to prepare for these assessment tasks so that we know what kind of questions will be asked. And I think, uh, you know, as a practicing interpreter and as a trainer, I find it very, very useful to know that that what I'm going to be interpreting and if I have access to it beforehand it makes some really really uh, great preparation material and uh, you know yeah. makes it really easy as interpreters for us to uh, on our on our memory skills as well as our anticipation skills um, which is going to be making your interpreting session a lot easier. Yes, and also definitely. just wanted to make a point that um, with practicing it even with a family member or someone else that speaks the language um, and then going through the questions as well helps. I think um, as assessors, we even practice um, using these tools with each other when we first started out. So um, using it as a yeah, as, as a practice session um, with each other also could help as well, um, just getting your confidence on what the questions are and um, how to translate them. That's a great idea, just doing a little bit of role play at home. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know, once you do a couple of those, especially for those interpreters that might not be so experienced um, with aged care assessments, it would be a, a, a really plus to go in there, kind of expecting what's going to be said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point, Angela. Well done, thank you very much, Angela and Paulina. Um, no now, on the next slide, I've just actually included um, a link to a video that you can watch in your own time um, of someone actually administering the RUDAS. So if you'd like to see how it's done um, before the assessment, then you've got that link there that you can go into and have a look at um, so you know what's involved in the, in the screening tool. Yep, so like I said earlier, for dear interpreters, uh, this has been uploaded, the slides have been uploaded, and uh, it has active hyperlinks on the slides. So if you go to slide 27 on your um, presentation slides that we have uh, given you on this webinar app, uh, you just have to click on this hyperlink and it'll take you to the video. It uh, goes for about 20 minutes and um, it, it really is a good watch because it'll go through step by step exactly how the RUDIS is uh, implemented um, and uh, I think you'll find that very useful. All right, um, so I'm just going to go over some information around briefing and debriefing, um, just part of you know usual practice um, attending an assessment. So the purpose of the briefing um, is for the ACAS assessor and the interpreter to have a shared understanding of the process um, of what's going to be interpreted, the communication, what the respective roles are, and also the goal of the discussion with the cold client. 
Um, and also just to give an indication of what assessment tools may be used during the assessment, um, just to help the interpreter, interpreter know ahead of time in preparation. Um, there's also just some information there from the OSET Code of Ethics, um, that briefing is, is important to, to occur as well prior to work. Um, I think just from my previous experience, when I would attend an assessment at someone's home, um, I would you know, introduce myself, let the interpreter know the name of the client, what the purpose of the assessment is. So for example, if I already knew that they're looking at a home care package, package I would explain that. Um, who else would be attending the assessment as well in the home? Um, just so that they know that there might be a partner there or another family member as well. Um, and what the assessment will be um, about um, in regards to you know, what our approvals are um, and how long it should take. So that's good just to have that um, <clears throat> communication prior um, to attending someone's home in the community. I think um, it's it's well. Thank you very much for bringing that up, Angela. I think it's very important for us to have that, even if it's a walk and talk of two minutes. Um, you know, mm -hmm. that is the 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 strawberry on top of an interpreter's uh, preparation. I think. You know, as an interpreter, you might have formal training. You might have gone to um, a, a university or a tertiary institution, studied for three, four years, five years. You know, that's preparation. And then you've got your webinars you attend to, PD sessions you attend to. That's further preparation. You get your job offer and then you've got, oh, aged care assessment. And then you go and do more specific preparation, maybe the week before or the day before, a few days before uh, coming to this particular assignment. And then all this preparation, adding on top of each other, building uh, like a lovely uh, mountain of knowledge, that two minute walk and talk just before the actual assignment really makes it all come together. You know, knowing that, um, you know, having this discussion with the assessor of what we're trying to do, what the aim and purposes are. You know, if it's a if it's a home uh, visit, uh, we meet the assessor outside. Maybe um, you know, I always try to find a car park behind them if I'm if I'm there after them, or I also make sure just to uh, introduce myself before we go in. And even if it's that walk and talk of a couple of minutes, I think it really puts everything in the context and really helps us to complete that preparation before going to that assessment. And one other point, um, especially if I know that the person may have a cognitive impairment or a dementia, I probably would also let the interpreter know that because they may be trying to interpret in a particular language, but the client isn't understanding because of their cognition, not because of the language barriers or you know, changes in dialect or um, instead. So if I did know that information, I would also share that with the interpreter as well, um, yep. just so they know what to expect. That's great because there's so many things in the in those last few minutes uh, that can be shared between the assessor and the interpreter. I think definitely will affect the outcome uh, of that particular assessment. And I think it's a collaborative uh, assignment as well when it comes to uh, assessments like this, um, especially with the uh, information that's given by the assessor as well as um, the information about potential uh, issues with the client or the culture that could be given by the actual interpreter you know it could be the fact that the um uh, the the uh, person who's being assessed the, the the client uh might be illiterate for example or they might have some kind of speech impairment that the assessor might not be aware of um and these things kind of could be shared as well and and even though it is the assessor who's driving the assessment and and they are trained to do so i think the interpreter plays a vital role in completing that assessment sharing that kind of information um uh in some cases during the briefing and in some cases uh, in the debriefing. Thanks, Fatty. Thank you. So the next point um, is just in relation to the debriefing. So this will occur after the assessments occurred um, and just gives the opportunity for the interpreter and the, the ACAS assessor um, to give some feedback on the session um, and also ask feedback from the interpreter as well because there might be some, you know, cues that they may have picked up um, or things that they felt that they might have been uncomfortable with or need more information um, to exchange this this um, after the assessment. But it's also um, included as, you know, I suppose a mutual learning um, 
process too and will enhance the quality of service delivered both from the assessor and also the interpreter for future assessments um, as well. So certain aspects might include the client's education level, which Patsy already mentioned, um, and if there's any cultural issues that might have been um, indicated during the assessment. And these can be discussed after the debriefing session as well. Um, yeah, like before we started today, we were talking about what some of those questions and the, you know, and I've, I've done my share of these um, assessments as well as an interpreter uh, in regards to, you know, sometimes you don't find equivalence because of a cultural matter or you don't find equivalence because, because of a linguistic matter. Um, and I think it's really important to speak about that in the debrief uh, with the assessor. For example, I, I always found that it was very difficult to interpret no ands, ifs or buts. I know that minimental is not used a lot these days and it's more the rudest, but I always found that very hard to interpret. And, uh, you know, I said to the assessor, afterwards I said look I don't know what the aim and purpose of this particular question is um, but you know it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one to interpret uh, and uh, uh, it, it was a really good way of um, uh, sharing that information with the assessor and then it's up to the assessor to do what they wish to do with that information um, you know whether they include that question in the assessment um, or, or not uh, but I think it's very important for us to share this kind of information I did another one where um, there were a lot of animals that was being shown to the uh, clients but some of those cli uh, animals were um, uh, like uh, walruses or, or um, you know, op opossums. I think it was like an American-based uh, assessment. And there were quite a lot of animals there that just culturally uh, we would not see on an everyday basis, especially if it's someone who wasn't very well educated and maybe didn't see so many um, David Attenborough specials, you know, and uh, they were given all these potential African animals and they just they just didn't know. And it's not because they didn't remember. They probably never seen a giraffe, um, mm. you know what I mean? And I think it's really important for us to speak about these potential issues after in a debriefing. So um, my well, fellow interpreters, uh, uh, yes, briefing and debriefing is very important. If you can get it in, do get it in. It doesn't take too long, a um, few minutes before and a few minutes after. Thank you, Feti. Can I just add something in relation to the topic of cultural issues? Because um, I feel like it's, it's such a broad topic. Um, and I'm curious as to find out what are those cultural issues. Um, from our work at the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing, um, we look at the way in which assessments and care planning can be conducted, um, taking into consideration cultural issues and diversity issues. So I guess um, from our perspective, you know, it could be things like um, the way in which um, clients connect with government services at large? Do they feel trusted? Do they feel safe in actually disclosing their information to a government um, body, for example? Other things such as gender, you know, yeah. do people need to feel comfortable um, disclosing personal and intimate issues with someone from the opposite gender? to them? Do they need someone from the same gender? For example, as it relates to female issues, hygiene, etc. Um, other things like decision making um, within the assessment process. So does the, the, the family member make the decisions on, on behalf of the, um, the older person's behalf? How do we manage those decision making and roles within families, etc, etc. But also open to perhaps hearing um, further about what those cultural issues might be. Um, because it's such a big topic and it's really important that it's not a one size fit all approach. Even though we do have the assessment tool, which is a one size fit all, the process and the experience uh, for the client is very, very different um, according to their cultural background, their life experiences, their history of trauma and discrimination. Um, and of course, what Feti mentioned around illiteracy or understanding the content, uh, but also things like dementia is not, um, always understood within all, within all cultures. Um, and also mental health is a very um, sort of arbitrary kind of concept in the, in the sense that not everyone wants to disclose um, their mental health issues. So just a few things to touch upon, I think is really important that it's not just the actual language that we need to look at, but also the cultural um, perspective as well. 
Mm. Um, yes, thank you very much, Lisa. So please, uh, if you have any comments about this or questions, uh, put, put, put them through. Uh, I probably won't be able to answer them or I won't be able to direct them to our presenters today, um, but um, I will direct those questions to uh, Angela, Paulina and Lisa, and of course that are interpreting related myself, and we'll get back to you in a written format um, within the next week or so. Um, I do know that we are running out of time and we've still got a few slides to get through. Uh, so um, thank you very much, Lisa, and uh, back to you, Paulina. So, oh, sorry, it's Angela here again. <laughs> so looking at some um, strategies for difficult situations. Um, so it's important just the introduction um, to the client, what the interpreter's role is at the assessment, um, ensuring that we acknowledge the client during the assessment um, and interpret the information asked by the assessor. Just also be aware that sometimes the family may be providing additional information um, and they may also try and interpret over the interpreter. So there might be multiple conversations going at once um, that can be quite difficult. And just ensuring that we're clearing, you know, speak clearly, adjust the space and location if needed as well, um, especially if someone may have some hearing impairment or have visual impairment and they prefer to be a bit closer um, or the space arrangements in a, in a particular area. A um, couple of other things. So just ensure that the role of the interpreter is to interpret exactly what has been said by the assessor and what the response um, of the client um, is important. And just an example of some positioning of where the interpreter should sit. So um, it's best to be in a triangle sort of um, positioning shape. Um, so the interpreter, the client and the interview can all see each other um, during the assessment. Um, um. Angela, can I comment on this as well, just very quickly? Uh, I think where possible, it's very important that um, we do take this uh, triangular position and in the interpreting world, we call this the golden triangle. Um, and uh, what it does is um, it, it also shows impartiality. You are equal distance with, with, as an interpreter, you are equal distance from the assessor, from the client. Um, and uh, especially with the non-English speaking client, you know, they can see that uh, there is no taking sides and uh, everyone can see each other clearly and everyone can see each other and, and hear each other clearly as well. So where possible, uh, the triangle is uh, definitely the best uh, positioning for the interpreter. Um, thank you very much. Just one other additional comment I want to make that um, during our COVID times, um, there has been additional challenges during assessments. So here in Victoria, majority of our assessments um, that have occurred face to face both the assessor and the interpreter have had to wear um, a face mask and possibly even a face shield um, during an interaction. Um, so that has sort of, you know, can affect the clarity of the conversation, um, especially if someone may have some hearing impairment, mm -hmm. but it also affects, you know, the visual cues as well from people's Definitely. facial cues, Definitely. so they can't see us. And there might be some mistrust there because we're wearing, you know, all this PPE um, even in the home environment. So that has been something that, um, you know, has affected our um, interactions with clients, um, especially in the community. But generally, most most people have been understanding and, you know, they probably feel um, that, you know, by us putting PPE on is actually protecting them from yeah, yeah. Um, any exposure too. So they do understand that you know, is, there is a role for it. When there's PPE required, um, do the ACAT team members provide the PPE uh, for the interpreter as well? Um, at, at our organisation, because we use a lot of in-house interpreters, um, their department had actually um, ordered and purchased PPE. So their interpreters are given packs um, of equipment to take with them. Um, however, we always, if we've got an interpreter that we know we're going to an assessment with an interpreter, we would bring additional PPE with us. Okay, to provide yep, that's great. Yep. Yeah, so we've always got extra stock. <laughs> yeah, that's great because I know that most people would have face masks these days. I mean, I've got a packet in every bag or in every corner I go to at home, yeah. um, but the uh, face shield is not something that everyone might have. So it's, it's really good yes. to know that you guys will um, have some backup in case uh, the interpreter it's doesn't have it on the on 
yeah, on what the policies are through yeah. each organisation and what's happening in the community amount, you know, depending yeah. on how much PPE we need to wear. Um, the regulations doing. change daily, so. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. And for our, for our organisation, we reverted to doing telehealth assessments and use and also telephone assessments. And even though we've started going back out into the community, um, we haven't in we're not going out with interpreters yet just to minimise the amount of people that are in the household. So we are um, using interpreters still via the phone, even though we're at the client's house. Yep. Um, but we do have some extra people. Yeah. Video interpreting is also an option these days as well. That's uh, probably been uh, quickly taking over the whole telephone scene, as it as it hopefully should eventually one day. Um, but you know, uh, video interpreting is also a good uh, alternative these days to face to face when it is not ideal. Yeah. And look, I mean, each state will be different. You know, they're guided by what their Department of Health are advising in regards to contact and and PPE and number of people in. Um, at, in people's homes too, so um, yeah, just have to review that. Um, just, so just some additional challenges for the cold um, consumers. So um, over the past 12 months, we have been undertaking um, a lot more telehealth, um, like Paulina has already mentioned. Um, sometimes there can be some issues in regards to having multiple people on a three, four way conversation um, using telehealth um, can affect um, the communication. Um, and you also can't visually see the person sometimes if it's only using phone interpreting. Um, if there's a disability there, so whether they may not be able to um, you know, understand or have some learning issues that may also affect um, the interaction. If there's any conflict with additional next of kin that might be at the assessment um, who also speak the language of the client. So this sometimes can be noted that, you know, a family member that might be under a lot of care or stress, there might be some arguing during the assessment. Um, and usually the assessor would try and calm um, the situation and just explain that, you know, we're here for the client, we understand what's, you know, your perspective as well. Um, but, you know, we're just trying to gather as much information we can to, to help the situation. So usually it would be the assessor that would guide um, the scenario if there was a bit of conflict or arguing during assessment as well. Um, dementia, that can also pose some challenges. So when you're interpreting, um, the client might not actually understand what you're saying, even it's in their first language. Um, and then maybe the responses might actually not make sense either um, in regards to what you're interpreting back. So usually interpreter would say, look, I don't, I don't understand what they're saying. Um, the, and the, you know, it doesn't make sense um, to what, what they're replying. Yeah. Family dynamics, yeah. as already just mentioned, um, hearing impairments is a big thing. Um, sometimes we may take um, some equipment to enhance the volume um, if someone's got hearing impairment and also speech impairment. So that could impact if they've had a stroke um, and their ability to express themselves um, when they communicate. So, you know, might be the language, but also whether they've actually got a speech impairment too that could um, impact on the information that's provided in the exchange during the assessment. Um, the other couple of things were smaller populations. The interpreter may actually know the family or the client. So sometimes this most, you know, there might be a bit of a conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, that can occasionally occur. Um, in, like I said, the smaller cold populations. So, the only available interpreter is actually a family member um, that knows the clients. And I think um, what's really important is that uh, the interpreter discloses this conflict of interest. Uh, you know, if you know the person that you're interpreting for, um, we always say when we're teaching, the first thing you do is you disclose. Yes, I know this person. And the second thing you do is you disclose the level of acquaintance. You know, how close are you with this person? Are you a cousin? Are you someone who went to school with them? Is that person your best friend's dad? You know, so we need to really tell the um, assessor uh, the level of acquaintance we have. And then we always say it's up to everyone in the room. So the assessor, they've got to be happy with it. Um, the client's got to be happy with it. 
the non-English speaking client, maybe they don't want you around because they're not comfortable sharing things um, with mm. you around there. And uh, thirdly, the interpreter's got to be okay with it too. So maybe you don't want to be interpreting for this person, okay? And we always say that um, as long as all three people involved are happy to go ahead, uh, even though there's a conflict of interest, then uh, it, it could go ahead. But if any one of these people aren't happy, um, uh, something else might need to be organized like getting a telephone or a video interpreter or maybe even um, uh, rescheduling the appointment you know but I think disclosure is very very important there yeah definitely it doesn't happen that often but it can can occur in, in certain cultural groups um, where yeah. there's limited um, interpreters available as well and it's a small community um, living in a similar area um, so finally, I'm just going to look at a, a quick case scenario, um, and this just just to give you some background of some of the um, issues that might arise during a, an interaction with um, an assessor, an interpreter, and a client, and just some of the consequences as well. So, um, so this is when family members um, interpret for a client. So the ACAS administration booked an interpreter for Mrs. Gregorio. Um, using the in-house interpreter that has been scheduled to interpret at the client's home. Um, but when she gets there, the client tells her not to worry about it because her daughter is already there and will interpret. So some of the issues that can be posed in this sort of situation is that um, there's, you know, a lack of medical terminology. Um, there might be some omission of the information, um, impartiality, conflict of interest, privacy of the information um, are some of the areas that would affect this situation. The assessor may not be able to differentiate between the information from the client and the family member, because it might just be the family member's perspective um, on the information they're providing. The client may also end up being excluded from the conversation because the family member's interpreting. Um, the client may also refuse the services of a professional interpreter because they might feel a bit more easy um, and comfortable with a family member being there and interpreting. Um, and the interpreter is there to offer a service to the clinician and the client alike. Um, so a client dismissing the interpreter does not mean that the interpreter is not required. So our policy is um, that we would um, recommend having an interpreter present. Um, in some cases that we may not have one available um, and the client's consenting to a family member, then we may actually use a family member depending on the circumstances. But if there's a conflict of interest that we know of um, or a complex case, um, then we would definitely ensure that we have um, an a, um, interpreter available. Angela, I think this happens quite often, uh, you know, more than we'd like it to happen. Um, but I think what we as interpreters need to remind ourselves is that we don't have just the one client, we have two clients. We have the assessor or the professional client and we have the non-English speaking client, so the cold client. Um, and our services are there for both of them, not just for one of them. So if a family member or, or, or the cold client says, well, I don't want an interpreter, um, we need to also keep in mind that in a, does the uh, assessor still need the interpreter? Okay, so we need to make sure, and in most cases, 99.9%, .9%, yes, the assessor is going to need the interpreter. So just because the cold client says, oh, I don't need one, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we say, okay, see you later. Always keep in mind that we have two clients. One is the professional client, and one is the non-English speaking or the cold client, and we are there to provide services for both of them, not just the one of them. And uh, like Angela was saying, in most cases, they are going to have our back. They are going to say, no, you might not need the interpreter, but I need the interpreter because I need to make sure that all the medical terminology is interpreted correctly and that it's interpreted impartially, uh, all the other reasons that um, Angela showed in the previous slide. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so it's just important the information, you know, that could be um, withheld from the client and the assessor could be compromising care. Um, so that's one of the consequences of this situation. Um, and sometimes that, you know, in certain circumstances, a family member may even provide unsolicited information like hints or answers, especially when um, a cognitive screening tool like the RUDAS has been conducted. Um, 
I think both Pauline and I have, have experienced that previously where family members have, have given hints and it will actually affect um, the overall score um, for someone that may actually have you know, a cognitive impairment there. Um, and also it also exposes the organisation to some liability as well. Um, if, if something you know, is not interpreted correctly um, in, in a professional manner with a, an actually professional trained interpreter. Um, so some of the solutions is that the interpreter should cautiously explain to the client and the family member that's in everybody's interests, um, that a professional interpreter is present during the medical examinations. Um, and that's also just reiterating what Fatih just said um, that you know you've got two clients, so that's the client um, and also the health professional um, at the assessment. Just state that the presence of a professional interpreter is a hospital policy, um, and if the family member insists on doing the interpreting, just explain that they you know will sit in the room as well and will intervene when communication is compromised. So you can still you know remain present um, because you are also there for the health professional as well. Um, and the interpreter's role is an integral part of, of the patient care as well, so just to explain that component. Um, and it's also safer for that professional interpreter to also be doing the interpreting. 